Well, good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. May I remind all those present to turn off any electrical devices, uh, or at least the sound, so that it doesn't interfere with today's proceedings. Um, first of all, item one is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed to do so? Thank you. Um, I have apologies from Gordon MacDonald, who's unavoidably detained elsewhere and may join us later in the meeting. Now, we are commencing our economic data inquiry, and we have five guests today. Uh, Richard Marsh, Margaret Cuthbert, John McLaren, Professor Richard Murphy, and Professor Katia Montana. So I'll ask them to introduce themselves shortly. Um, the remit for the inquiry is to examine the accuracy, utility, and comprehensibility of Scottish economic statistics uh, to consider what data is required for effective delivery and scrutiny of policy, and perhaps most importantly, we, we would like to, after looking at this issue, recommend where any improvements might be made. So we'll go to our roundtable session, and the idea is that hopefully discussion will flow uh, freely but not too freely and if anyone wishes to come in if they could just indicate by raising their hand uh, so that I can bring them into the discussion at that point. But we'll start uh, perhaps with each of our guests just introducing themselves and very briefly stating their organization and the, the focus of their work. I'll start with to my left with Richard Marsh, and then we'll move around the table, so from Richard to Margaret and so forth. So perhaps first of all, Richard Marsh. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Marsh. I'm the economics director of a small independent consultancy based in Kirkcaldy, and I've been working on economic data in Scotland for nearly 20 years. Hello, I'm Margaret Cuthbert. I work for no one, not even my <laughs> husband. <laughs> and. And uh, I started off uh, um, at, in a big business, ICI, and then worked in, uh, as a lecturer, but for many years then worked as a consultant. But in recent years, and I mean that by the last 15, I've worked in major issues on the Scottish economy, but may I say as completely independent people um, on PFI, on Scottish water, on JERS, um, but on major issues to do with Scotland. Thank you. Um, Ex-civil servant at the Treasury and the Scottish Government, briefly a SPAD under Donald Dewar and Henry McLeish, and then working for CPPR at Glasgow University and um, Fiscal Affairs Scotland, now defunct, currently mainly working in Scottish Trends website. Richard Murphy, I'm Professor of International Political Economy at City University of London. As you will tell, I'm not Scottish. Um, I wrote a blog earlier this year on JERS, and as a result, I seem to have become engaged in this debate. I'm a chartered accountant by original training, um, and I probably am unusual in being both an economist and an accountant and bring both perspectives to this debate. Uh, I'm Katia Montagna. I'm a Professor of Economics at the University of Aberdeen. My area of research is uh, mainly international economics, and uh, I've been uh, working with teams uh, across Europe on, recently in particular, on the effects of globalization, labor markets, and competitiveness. Thank you. And I should say that the, the sound desk will deal with the, the microphones. Uh, you don't need to press any buttons on the desk in, in front of you. Um, could I start with perhaps the question, what is the, the one thing that each of our witnesses would consider the key point in improving Scottish data? Which one of our witnesses would like to come in first on that? Margaret Cuthbert. To my mind, actually, we're very lucky with the statistics um, professional staff that we have here. My big problem is that in searching for data, it's a political reason why I can't get the data. And I'd like us really to examine that. We've um, come from a dependency or a, a province of the United Kingdom through devolution, which was accepted by everyone. Um, we got our own parliament. 
I don't think we have made enough of the political independence independence to a certain extent that that gave in looking after our economy and in collecting the type of data that is needed to run an economy and that goes all the way through from agriculture, fisheries, tourism, transport, you name it. We need um, more discussion of these matters and it's political matters that need to be discussed because our statisticians cannot provide the data unless they have the purse to do so. And that includes, for example, in um, exports, where a survey can go out to a very large number of thousands, they get a fifth of the answers back, and they cannot force people to answer the questionnaire. And on that, we base part of our uh, export statistics. Who else would like to come in? Um, Professor Murphy. I'd like to agree with Margaret, to be totally honest. I think the interest I always have in data is how decision useful is it? And the data that exists appears to not be decision useful. It was designed a long time ago for a different environment and has been modified since, and quite clearly has been modified with good intent. Nobody questions that in the slightest. But it ends up not being of much use to anybody in Scotland, whether in the political domain or not, to actually decide what decisions have been made, who was responsible for them, were they successful, and what should now change as a consequence. And that's what this data should do for people. But it isn't doing that, and it needs to be redesigned to achieve that goal. And I would entirely agree as well that the problem is that the data to make this information decision useful does not exist. I've concentrated heavily on tax because that is the area where I have most expertise. But quite simply, the present point of time, the UK VAT system, the UK payroll, PAYE system, the UK personal tax system, and in particular the UK corporation tax system, as well as UK company data, does not provide information that lets Scottish information be separately identified on a reliable basis. As a consequence, we ha end up with a situation where so much that is looked at is inherently unreliable and can't be used to form decisions. Someone else wish to come in? Richard Marsh? Um, just in danger for the first time of having all the economists agree, <laughs> I would like to put myself fully behind both those statements to say um, we know that the Office for National Statistics is moving away from large-scale surveys to making more use of this administrative data that Professor Richard Murphy just talked about. So if the VAT, the payroll, the corporation tax, isn't properly identifying the Scottish part of businesses and individual activities, we're going to be in a very awkward position the one thing I would probably say I would like to uh, look at is what we've not yet had in Scotland is starting from a position with a blank sheet of paper. For the last 20 years, we've always taken the existing figures and statistics we've produced and saying how can they be supplemented, how they can be amended, how can they be improved. No one's really asked the fundamental question saying starting from scratch, what would you measure to help us make good decisions about how to grow Scotland's economy? To do that, I would suggest we need to have a more independent team of statisticians based in Scotland who can be innovative, who can create, who can look at the next generation of statistics that need to be produced. Thank you. And John McLaren. Yeah, I'll change the subject a little, although by and large I agree with what's been said so far. But to, to bring it back to a slightly more basic level and to the economy, um, I think the first thing we need to finish off is, is get a full set of national accounts. Um, at the minute, national accounts are published, but a lot of it is derived or residuals. Um, there's very little on the balance of payments, very little investment. These are key areas for the economy as a whole, and if you want to then model the economy, which you'll need to do with the, with the new powers. Um, and to finish off those national accounts will require more resources because the balance of payments, uh, including um, foreign investments to and from Scotland, is very complicated. So more resources in terms of, of money, in terms of good surveys, but also in terms of staffing of people um, interpreting that data. Um, 
and then once you've got the national accounts in place, then you can start to, and the, the basics in place, then you can start to add other things, whether it be in the environment or wider measures. But I think that is the, the initially the, the key um, area to, to concentrate. That's where the, much of the push has been put in so far, and I think we should extend that push until it's finished. Thank you. And Professor Montana? Yeah, I, I would endorse what has been said. I would also add, however, that uh, there, are, uh, th there is a, a, an enormous wealth of data which already exists and which, which, which we are not able to access as well as we could, particularly at the microeconomic level. Um, data exists, it underpins aggregate statistics, but researchers cannot access them. And, uh, and I think that, uh, therefore, you know, if, if you think strategically in terms of how to go about improving the data situation in Scotland. I think in the long term, yes, all which has been said in terms of greater autonomy and uh, of the Scottish government and, and collection of new data is important, but it's also important in the shorter term at a relatively, I think, um, cost effective, in, in, in relatively cost effective manners to try to, to improve what exists and, and accessibility to what exists is a key issue. Thank you. And I think John Mason had... Uh, well, it was, it was actually on that point, and it was what uh, Margaret Cuthbert said, which was uh, we're not collecting the data. I mean, is that the problem? We're not no one's collecting the data, or somebody's collecting it, and we can't see it? Well, okay, that, that's a very good point. Um, there's an awful lot of data collected in Scotland. But the way in which we have virtually been forced down the road of, for example, public procurement and you all know the history of public procurement and the PFI system, has meant that we've ended up with uh, non-departmental public bodies being in charge of large parts, for example, of public procurement. They themselves have either produced tremendous glosses which give figures, and I tell you from experience of many hours, you cannot get beyond the glossy figure on the, on the thing. I cannot get the basis on which we've they found. I might be told there was a survey carried out, but I cannot find the detail of the survey. And for somebody who once was called anally retentive by a Scottish government official, um, <laughs> obviously I do like to find the detail. Now this has become even worse with the Scottish Futures Trust who established hubs and while the Scottish Futures Trust is a non-departmental public body and is subject to freedom of information, the hubs are not. So how do you find the information? As I've said before, we don't have some information. We don't have any information really on imports. How can we run the country as we hope to do in the future, no matter which political persuasion you are, if we do not have this basic types of, of data? I think so being... you're right in two points. Some data isn't collected, we don't have the powers to do it, and some data, through the system that has been introduced um, of NDPBs and their associates, we cannot get the data. And so if I could say finally, freedom of information actually lets us down, as you probably know, in that previously it was 25 years or 20 years, now it's 15. If you're putting up schools in Edinburgh and it's 15 years before somebody like myself can actually get the contracts to see what's happening in construction, the buildings may be falling down before you get the, and a child killed before you get the information. Um, follow up from Dean Lockhart. Yes, it was a follow up on the asks for additional data uh, across the table and it's interesting to see so much consensus amongst uh, economists. Um, I think we all agree that there is need for more data and, and, and better data, but I think we also need to prioritise, uh, given limited resource in, in this area, uh, with, with all areas. So with the fiscal framework now with us, could I ask our guest what, what would be the, the bare minimum, do you think, in terms of data, st statistics and resource, we need to effectively implement the fiscal framework, not just implement it, but, but model around it and understand the impact it will have on Scottish economy and the Scottish public finances? What would be the, the bare minimum ask to, to be ready for the fiscal framework? Richard Marsh. Um, that's quite a big ask. Uh, what I would say is the, um, the thing that struck me from the 
Scottish Economic Statistics plan that was produced, I think, a couple of weeks ago, um, said that we have 11 full-time staff working on national accounts for Scotland, producing our GDP, investment figures, and so on. Uh, in the Bean review, he highlighted that New Zealand has 60 full-time equivalent staff working on their national accounts. The UK has around 170. So I suppose... It's difficult to sort of provide a sense of the resource needed, but certainly, even compared to countries of comparable size, Scotland's national accounts team is is small. And this is the point I think I've raised in my submission that they're kind of um, perhaps unfairly calling them statistical scavengers because they're basically trying to pick the bones of what are essentially UK data sets. Could I just make a small point on, um, I think, what John Mason was... Uh, talking about earlier as well. There's a difference between the macroeconomic indicators um, that I think Margaret and so on was, was talking about, saying what's our liabilities, what's our capital investment, so on. And then there's the micro data, and that is almost criminally underused. We have a vast set of data covering most businesses in Scotland, saying what their turnover is, how many people they're employing, how quickly they're growing. We can link various sets of data together to say, have these companies been supported by the enterprise agencies? If they were, did they grow more quickly than the ones that weren't? Have they been kite marked by the tourism industry? What happened to their productivity? Do they add more value? Those kind of things are largely a question of finding a way to press buttons on a computer. Now that, the, 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 but the, the, the thing that kind of surprised me from the submissions, if you look at the submissions from Slade, you ask them, Local authorities across Scotland, what do you want from economic data? They said uh, increased localised data, a few other things, and publication of sub-indicators. They're asking more local data to publish it more quickly, to include smaller businesses, and provide more detail. To me, that reads they actually don't know what they want. They're not really telling you we need the following things. We've just had a review of business rates in which we could have pulled from that data set how much a whole range of different types of businesses are actually paying in rates compared to how much profits they're making, broken down by small towns, industrial estates, however you chose to do it. And we didn't do it. And the issue is, it's not a reasonable position for Slade to take. I actually think they don't know what's possible. And so we have the Scottish Government statisticians sat on this vast reservoir of data that could be used to a huge range of um, policy applications. And the people that could use it, largely not fully <coughs> understanding quite reasonably what, what it can do. And we've got to try and have a meeting of minds there somewhere. But it, are you saying that partly that's because there's not the staff? I mean, I think you referred to pushing buttons on computers, but if you don't have enough people to push the buttons, you can't do it. Is that what you're saying, or is it? Beyond, go, does it go beyond that? Um, what I would say is it's possibly an issue that you would need some extra staff. I think if you're going to create a lot more data, you would need more staff. But I would say there's a culture issue here in that you can ask the question, um, if your job is to produce a set of data describing turnover for 10 standard defined industries, and that product has been produced for the last 10 years, I wonder who's going to thank you for saying we've produced a fantastic new way of cutting this seven different ways, which show really interesting things about Scotland's economy. Right. I'd like to bring in Richard Murphy. A bare minimum would be to, first of all, agree what the accounting framework is, um, because as I've outlined, I don't believe that what we have, Scotland has at present, is adequate. Income is accounted for on one basis, and expenditure is accounted for on another basis, and the consequence is that expenditure is always going to be higher in proportion to income in JERS, and it should be in a properly balanced accruals accounting system, because in an accruals accounting system, you have to undertake both on the same basis, and that is not the case in JERS at present, and therefore, right now, the accounting framework is simply incorrect. Um, I've also suggested, and I agree with John McLaren, that I think that there is a demand here for a 
full set of national accounts, but that would also, of course, include a proper estimation of what the liabilities of Scotland are as well. Um, not just imports and exports and so on, but also what are the assets and liabilities, because you actually need to have a framework against which you're measuring improvement or not, and without that, you actually haven't got an accounting system. Um, and that is absent as well at present. So there is a very real need to go right back to <laughs> this, the start point that Richard Marsh referred to. That would be a first bare minimum. The second, I am persuaded that although there are major problems, as Margaret Cuthbert has explained, with regard to getting data, with regard to expenditure, expenditure is probably better, at least within Scotland, not for Scotland, but within Scotland, better recorded than any other part of the existing data, even if it is difficult to get at. Whereas the income side of the equation is very difficult to pretend that it's properly recorded. I was at another hearing in this parliament earlier this year where we were discussing taxation and devolved taxation powers. And what is very clear is that there are inherent conflicts of interest inside many of those devolved taxation powers that are contradictory, make it exceptionally difficult for anyone in Scotland to decide how to use the power because, for example, Tax income taxation on earned income is devolved and income taxation on unearned income is not, and it is incredibly easy for a taxpayer to read, describe their income from being earned to unearned and therefore avoid the powers. So there does have to be, if those devolved powers are to be properly used, much better information on taxation. And that does require a new agreement between the Scottish Government and HMRC, uh, not Revenue Scotland, but HMRC, because this is a UK as a whole decision, to identify in particular where VAT um, destination, the point of delivery of services is, not the point of supply, but the point of delivery, because that's what is important for VAT and is not recorded. But also with regard to corporation tax, for example, who owns Scottish companies, companies that appear to be Scottish, and how to apportion income between the two. And this is an area I've worked on for 15 years and been told persistently it's not possible. But now we are reaching international agreements on things like country by country reporting to apportion income between states. If we can now agree how to do that in broad principle within Europe, we must be able to agree how to do it in broad principle within the UK. It just requires the political willing to actually produce the underlying data to achieve that goal. And it's not that difficult to do. John McLaren. Yeah. The I guess the, the answer to the question goes, what are you going to use the data for? So currently we're quite well, um, dis we have quite a lot of data versus other regions of the UK, if you don't mind my expressing it in those terms at the minute. Um, but we don't actually use it for very much. Academics um, bit rarely use the Scottish data. I mean, some will, and the microdata is maybe slightly different, but in terms of GDP data, uh, national accounts data, um, because it's not in their interests, um, because it doesn't do them much good in terms of their career. It's not really used in the public debate. I mean, I put out something every time the quarterly GDP figures come out, and um, I'm rarely, if ever, is anybody interested or is, or is anything picked up in the papers. And this goes through to a point I made in my paper about um, the media aren't particularly interested. I myself would say that the parliament isn't particularly interested in comparison to other parliaments in the economy. Um, so if you're not actually going to use it for much, you're kind of wasting your money if you're, if you're going to put it into that. Apart from, at the minute, now with, um, you, you, with the extra powers, you'll need to forecast. So that means you'll, you'll need a, a decent model, which again goes that back to decent national accounts. But even in that model, you could spend, models are very expensive to, to run, and you could spend quite a lot of time and money in that model and get results that are guaranteed to be wrong. How wrong is, a, is an issue, but the OBR has an awful lot of money and is always wrong, and has been very badly wrong for a number of years now. All Scottish models currently are not as, as um, extensive, as developed as the OBR's ones. So if they were better, that would be pure happenstance. So, again, you're not going to get thanked for building a, a, a complex model that's quite expensive when it continually comes out with stuff that proves to be wrong, um, which is a point that Jeremy Paxman puts at the head of the OBR in, in, in a famous interview. 
So uh, it, it's a difficult question to answer because there isn't, um, you're not guaranteed to get something that, is def that isn't necessarily going to help you uh, and a lot. The only thing I would say about the model is that, yes, the model will be um, of variable quality and, and, and be wrong most of the time and will never get um, big ups and downs, but who would not try and model what their public finances are going to be? You are flying blind if you don't do that. In the same way that a company wouldn't, wouldn't it doesn't know what it's going to sell, but it's going to make a, a prediction or, or a forecast of what it, it hopes to sell and then adjust as time goes on. And that's what you do with models. Thank you. I'm going to take another couple of supplementaries from committee members and then perhaps bring the, our other two guests in on, on this question from Dean Locker. First of all, Gillian Martin and then Richard Leonard. So we're about to embark in this parliament this week and probably for many months to come on a big tax debate on income, Scottish rate of income tax. This, these gaps in this data, this is urgent, absolutely urgent. And I want to know your, your, your thoughts on the, the issues around the, the lack of information that we get on taxes that are reserved. And obviously um, that includes corporation tax, that and how that lack of information around Scottish uh, corporation tax um, raised in Scotland, VAT raised in Scotland, is going to uh, impact on the tax debate around the Scottish rate of income tax, given the gaps that we have. Right, and uh, perhaps Richard Le Leonard's question then will bring our guests in on, on these issues. Um, thanks, Convener. It was to reflect on something which uh, both Richard Murphy said and uh, I know um, John McLaren includes um, in his uh, written submission, uh, and, uh, and Margaret Cuthbert also talks as well about business registration. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in a couple of areas around this. First of all, uh, to what extent do we really capture um, all businesses that operate in Scotland uh, versus businesses that are registered in Scotland versus bu businesses that are registered uh, in the rest of the UK versus businesses that are registered overseas. Uh, you know, I wonder how thoroughgoing the collection of data is uh, in all of those areas because we know that uh, from statistics how reliable they are, we shall see, but around about a third of the turnover or the GVA in the Scottish economy is overseas owned. Uh, which is why I think John McLaren makes the point in his paper that we're moving to a, uh, to a calculation now of gross, gross national income rather than just gross domestic product in order to try to understand the extent to which there is leakage from the Scottish economy. So I don't know, I, I don't know whether you could perhaps um, give us your thoughts on that new development and also where we stand and how reliable do you think we are uh, with the collection of data uh, based upon uh, country of ownership. Perhaps Margaret Cuthbert and then Katia Montana. Right. Well, there is actually a lot of work going on right now in statistics in the Scottish Government on businesses, and they're working with ONS on that, and that's going on just now. I quite appreciate the position right now is very difficult. For example, in the tables that we get, there'll be ones that say businesses with no employees. Now, you can sit and think about that for long enough. What exactly does it mean, a business with no employees? And yet, it might be in there as we have had a growth in the number of businesses. Well, what, what's the use of that? We also have, as you've rightly said, the problem of um, other companies from other countries who are owning our assets. Now, this becomes extremely difficult when, for example, we've got these new hubs set up, and each one of them has a private company in there it turns out for some of them, that private company <coughs> was only established a couple of months before they got the contract to be part of the, the team of the hubs. And being part of that team is really important because if you're a big um, construction company and you're in that group, I'm dash sure you get quite a lot of the, the business. And when you look at that company that's just been established, Scottish company registered in Scotland, you find that all of the directors are in a street in Lombard Street in London. So we're wide open to big, big problems which are really not statistical and that need other types of uh, input which we've not got. And that's a really important point um, on the way through. So hopefully that type of 
I mean, and I'm getting carried away. There are other things I wanted of other ones, so I'll leave that to be, so you will come back to that, hopefully. Thank you. And uh, Katia Montani. Yeah, I, I think the, the issue of um, uh, the ownership is, is a big one, because the Scottish Government uh, supplements the annual business survey by commissioning to, um, what is it called now, um, Dun and Bradstreet, to, to, to provide information about um, the companies which are foreign owned, but we don't get hold of those, we cannot put our hands on those data. I mean, the data are, um, the, the information uh, is, is produced at the industry level, but we don't have information at the firm level. So whereas the annual business survey data can be accessed to the, uh, through the ONS Secure Lab, the Scottish data cannot. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I disagree slightly with what uh, John McLaren said earlier, that academics are not, do, do not have an interest in, in doing work on Scotland. I mean, regional uh, disparities, for example, in productivity are very central to economic research, but it's very difficult to get hold of the data to analyze this as far as Scotland is concerned. And the data does exist, so accessibility is a key issue, as well as the, the, the ability to link the different data sets. Um, and, and, and this is, I go back to what I said earlier, not, not all of the intervention which is required is necessarily very costly. Um, I'm not a, a statistician, so I don't know exactly uh, how many buttons need to be pressed, but certainly it, 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 I, I don't envisage it to be very difficult to, to you know, link, link, think, link things up at the source, uh, upstream. In, in other countries, the, data, the different data set sets are all linked up, um, um, as I say, upstream. And in, in, in the UK, it is you know, the individual researcher who has to make the effort to link them up. And apart from the margin of error, which clearly increases, but we may have three different people in Scotland doing the same thing. So there is a, a huge duplication of effort and, and in essence, a, you know, a waste of public money because we are, we are uh, doing things uh, more than once. Um, just, are, are we in a situation where the data exists, or is it a question of definition? So, for example, we'll come on to Richard Murphy, but he commented about companies. Now, yeah. you've got, obviously, you've got Scottish registered companies, English registered companies yes. that can operate in England, Scotland, and abroad. Um, you can have English, an example, an English registered company, but owns property or land in Scotland, which is then rented out. Um, all sorts of questions about how that income is defined as being Scottish for taxation purposes or not um, arise. So is it that the information is not available in a data form that economists can use? Or is it the question of the definition, which may go into political questions already referred to about how that income should be defined as whether it's Scottish or English or in what way. And if one thinks the international level, big companies like Google and so forth and where they pay tax or how much tax they pay, what, what exactly is the, the I, nub I, of the issue for I you? I think there are certainly discrepancies between data sets about methodological definitions mm -hmm. as, as well as sample size. So. Um, that is probably where also some cultural change is required, not only mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in addressing issues of accessibility, but also there, there is a, a difference between accessibility and ease of use. Mm -hmm. So you can access sometimes the data sets, but then when you try to put them together, they don't match in terms of mm -hmm. definition, in terms of sample size and uh, time coverage and so on. So uh, there definitely are uh, issues in Scotland with respect to all of those uh, dimensions. But all I'm saying is that uh, making an effort in trying to overcome the accessibility and the linkability issue will also bring to the fore uh, that type of, of constraints. And, and, and it, you know, there, are, there is an infrastructure in place in the UK uh, about data collection, which, and I go back to something that Richard Murphy said earlier, I mean, it is, I think, very possible to, uh, and, and should be very desirable to try to work more closely with the ONS and uh, HMRC and so on to, to make sure that the, the UK uh, data collection has a better reflection of, of, of the Scottish, uh, you know, uh, sample. Thank you. And Richard Murphy, you wanted to come in. I do, because I think these two questions are directly related to each other. 
Um, the question on income tax, um, somebody asked me to write about this yesterday, and the I would repeat basically what I said in April um, here um, in this room. Um, the question on income tax in Scotland is one of how effective is a rate rise going to be, um, more than anything else. And the answer is it may well not be very effective because it is so easy for people to incorporate what otherwise looks like an employment, turn it into a company. Um, it will have an employee, I expect. It won't have no employees, but it will probably have one who will be paid a tiny salary, will then be paid a dividend to cover the rest of the remuneration, and that will be subject to UK-wide income tax rates, not Scottish income tax rates, and so tax avoidance will go on. Um, it is as simple and straightforward as that. Scotland cannot enforce its own will with regard to its own income tax rate when it is so easy for income to leave the Scottish tax system. And the question I was asked was, will there be massive capital flight out of Scotland to avoid a Scottish tax rate? And my answer was straightforwardly, no, there doesn't need to be, because you can turn it into capital within Scotland and not pay tax on it, so it doesn't need to fly anywhere. The tax system lets that happen domestically. And at that point, this debate becomes, you know, not meaningless, of course. There are loads of employees in Scotland, but there is going to be a lot of um, tension as a result of that. But this also spills over into this question of do we know about Scottish businesses? There is a very interesting statistic which Companies House, based in Cardiff, produce every year because that is where the Scottish company register is actually run. Um, and it says there have been no prosecutions under Scottish law with regard to breaches of company um, law since 2008. Now, I don't know why there have been no prosecutions under Scottish law with regard to breaches in company law since 2008, but they appear to say they don't know of any. Uh, does that mean that Scottish law does not exist with regard to the application of company law now? I don't know. Um, it probably doesn't. Why? Because we don't have any company registration in the UK anymore. Let's be clear, the company registrar in the UK receives information, but it does not check its quality. There are apparently four people reviewing the accounts of nearly four million companies to make sure that they have some truth and accuracy. I will tell you that the only piece of information that is checked on a form sent to Companies House is the postcode. So long as you put an accurate postcode on, then your form will be filed. Everything else is just inconsequential. They do like the balance sheet of a set of accounts to balance, but given that not every company that manages that and they get away with it, that's how weak the data is. We don't know who owns the companies. The new reg regulation on beneficial ownership is entirely voluntary. You can get round it by simply saying there isn't anybody who controls this company and nobody checks at all. There is no data on source and destination of revenues. Um, and 90% of small companies don't have to file accounts which show a profit and loss account anyway. Bluntly, we are living in the Wild West when it comes to, um, or the Wild North, if you like, um, when it comes to company registration um, and data from Companies House. Um, if you want to have a point to start, have a Scottish company registry that actually enforces beneficial ownership rules, which requires that full accounts be put on public record, which reduces the risk and actually says that you'll meaningfully prosecute people when they don't fulfil their obligations to either file accounts or pay their tax. But at the moment, so many people get around their obligations by registering a company, it's ridiculous. It's just licence fraud. But surely is that not dealt with by directors' disqualification actions, which, of course, there have been in Scotland since 2008? All, all I'm saying is that they... carry on quite regularly, do they not? They say they're not taking place under Scottish law. I don't know why they say they're not taking place under Scottish law. Well, but that's what, what, what companies say. What is not taking place under Scottish law? They say there are no, they do not know of actions under Scottish law. Perhaps they're using English law to prosecute in Scotland. I genuinely don't know why they make this weird claim. The point is, though, let's not worry too much about that particular issue. The point is this is a UK-wide issue. There are around 5,000 prosecutions a year for failure to comply with companies' house regulations. I don't dispute that. Of the, of the prosecutions, over half are dropped when somebody turns up with a document, which is the reason for the prosecution. In other words, if you haven't filed your accounts but then offer them to the court, the prosecution is dropped. That reduces to 2,500. But 400,000 companies a year in the UK as a whole, not for Scotland, but in the UK as a whole, but proportionally, I suspect the data is the same for Scotland, disappear without trace. That means they are literally struck off the register because they don't meet their legal obligations. 
So in other words, they don't have to pay their tax because they simply disappear and very few of these cases are, are pursued. Less than 1% are pursued. Well, it's I so easy to get around your tax obligations as sorry, a result. You're not in a position to tell us how many directors have been subject to disqualification proceedings in Scotland. In I don't know the precise figure of Scotland, but it will be a couple in, of in hundred, maybe. To, sorry, let me, if I may. Sorry. In relation to failing to file uh, documentation or accounts, you wouldn't be able to tell us that, would you? I would be very surprised if it's more than 200 a year. So there might be that? that there might figure. be. Right. But, but, you're but it's not a, a tiny proportion of the number of companies in Scotland. You know, the Scottish Government says there's well, 345,000 businesses in Scotland. Yeah, well, just let me t stop you there. But if you're, you don't know the numbers, I mean, we don't know the proportion of companies. We don't know what is being done in terms of government enforcement in Scotland. One would have to look at the actual statistics of what actions are being brought before the courts and so forth and so on. But again, you're, you're, I'm not a, you're not in a position to comment on that, are you? I'm saying to you that there isn't the data available, and anyway, there isn't a system to make that data meaningful because there isn't a proper regulatory system to ensure that there is compliance in the first place. Okay. No, I mean, that, that's a different question. There may not be data accessible to someone like yourself. But, but that's, that's why I can't answer your question. Well, that's fair enough. But one cannot then, or you cannot, make assertions about there not being prosecutions or whatever type of court actions being I was quoting Carrie's House. They Scotland. say there are no prosecutions under Scottish law. Yeah. Okay, well, perhaps we can move on. I think Richard Marsh wanted to add comment, and I think Andy Whiteman then wanted to come in with a, a question. Very quick point. Um, not wanting to, to uh, do down anything that was just spoken about, but I, th I think the point is that businesses are messy um, and they're difficult to measure, uh, almost in the same way just like I get my toddler ready for her nursery in the morning, businesses can make it very difficult for you to measure them. They don't stay in place, they move about and they change and they occasionally go out of their way to make your life very difficult. Um, the point that Richard Landed was, was making, he said a third of the economy is uh, foreign owned. You, you, you mean the, the business economy. Yeah. There's a big issue with trying to measure the public sector in Scotland and we shouldn't lose sight of that, that actually we really need to know how productive our public services are in Scotland. And the only point, I suppose, is, is, is um, Katya, again, I kind of agree with, with most of the points that, that you've made. I actually think it's great when you have um, messy data sets colliding together that actually don't make sense. Because if they did, I would be equally as, as, as suspicious of them. So the ideal world is to actually take these data sets that probably weren't made for linking together, but to actually put a bit of time and effort in to try and say, are there consistent messages coming out of this? To Julian Martin, your point about how can we measure these things properly, um, if we come to kind of like, if we appreciate this is difficult to do, but what's the best method to do it? I was always amused by trying to measure corporation tax in Scotland, and we always said, well, what's the value of our economy? what proportion of that is roughly profits, the operating surplus, and we'll take a pro rata of what the UK is doing. Hugely blunt, but you can say, okay, well, it's probably, it's probably not a million miles away, but it's probably wet finger in the air about there. Could we get any more data from the Treasury and HMRC? No, absolutely not, impossible. 2014, um, suddenly we get a beautiful piece of research linking all the administrative data and corporation tax records with businesses identified as Scottish to actually get a far better measure of corporation tax paid. So, Gordon, I think that's the point I was making in terms, terms of the culture. It's when there's pressure, there's a need to actually think of a better way to do things. Methods are, are, are quite often found. Thank you. No. Sorry, John McLaren, then Andy Whiteman. I think Margaret Cuthbert wanted to come in perhaps after Andy's point. Yeah, John McLaren. Just on the, on the taxes that we have and, and perhaps the corporation tax that, that would be interesting. I mean, the, the three big taxes are income tax, national insurance, VAT. Those by far outweigh all the other taxes in terms of size. <clears throat> but it's, the, the debate in, at the minute in Scotland is about perhaps moving the additional rate up or down. The additional rate doesn't give you much, very much extra money, so unless you use the, move the basic rates. And also, that interestingly, before 
the Laffer curve was used by Alex Salmon to say that cutting corporation tax might be a good idea to get more people in. But that was obviously originally um, applied to the income tax. So the studies that the Scottish Government should do should be looking at both sides. They should be saying, if you cut income tax, would that actually bring more people in by being extra competitive? Uh, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but I mean that's what the study should be doing from, from all sides. Because we don't have corporation tax powers at the minute, probably leave that out for the minute. But it is becoming, it is quite a, a, a difficult issue because you've then got to say, well, what in the current modern day are going to be the behavioural impacts to those changes, which is probably unknown, but you can be guessed at at best. Um, can I finish my point and then? You know? And the other thing is, going back to Richard's point, I mean, we don't really need to have GNI modified GDP or whatever as a region, um, even with some taxes devolved, if we don't want to. If you had full, fis full independence or full fiscal independence, it would be important. We don't need it. But what it is important or interesting for is, is in terms of getting the right policies, even with if you stay a partially devolved region within the UK. Because, for example, how do you improve Scottish ownership? How do you, um, how do you make these things that are currently a, an issue better? And, and, and you won't you won't understand that until you have a fuller understanding of the economy, which is why the Irish economy looks at these about three or four different measures and just in, just recently introduced a new modified GNI measure because the, the old two measures suggested that in 2015 the Irish economy in real terms had grown by 25%, which is clearly absurd. Um, so they had to introduce a new measure which only goes back a few years. I mean, that, but, but Scotland is, a, is in a similar situation, partly because of oil, partly because of foreign ownership, that it's very difficult to actually really understand what is going on with the Scottish economy and therefore how wealthy and prosperous it, it is and how it's growing. Sorry. Um, to bring Andy Whiteman in in case he has a point that's um, going to be superseded if we carry on in this very interesting dis discussion. Thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to move the conversation on a little bit. I, mean, I was interested in Richard Marsh's comment about starting with a blank sheet of paper. Um, and I think this is an opportune inquiry because we're at an important time in terms of public finances and uh, tax powers in this parliament and the intertwining between the interrelationship between um, tax powers and how they're used and the performance of the economy. I noted in a number of witnesses' statements, I thank everyone for giving a lot of very, very useful written evidence, that there was, there seemed to be support for making um, the Scottish Statistical Collection a more independent project with an independent authority, um, possibly with more powers. I was a bit disappointed to read Scottish Enterprises' evidence that said the Scottish economic data are reliable as far as we were, are, are aware, and if there are any inaccuracies, for whatever reason, they're likely to be small. It's our chief uh, economic development agency for the centre, centre of Scotland. Um, so I just wonder what witnesses would agree that we need to move in a direction that gives us a more independent statistical authority with greater powers to compel the acquisition um, of data. And I note, for example, whatever one thinks of the argument between the chair of the ONS and Boris Johnson, um, that the chair of the ONS felt able to speak out when he, rightly or wrongly, felt that statistics were being misused. We couldn't do that in Scotland because there is nobody um, of that nature commenting, at least on Scottish statistics. I'm sure the chair of the ONS would speak out if he felt that any members of the Scottish Government were misusing UK and ONS collected statistics. So I just wonder what your view about independence and greater powers for st stats in Scotland. Perhaps we start with Margaret Cuthbert. Yes, very happy to answer in that one. We actually did have much more independence on the chief statistician speaking out in Scotland prior to devolution. At that particular time, he or she could go, it's always a he, mind you, could always go directly to the head of ONS and stand up for the quality of statistics. That went with devolution. Um, I cannot think of any example where the chief statistician has been able to stand up and say, we're not doing that. And in fact, we have seen recently even that the accounts commissioner gave in, um, if that was true, that was in the papers. But actually, if we had one, um, Andy, we, we might actually have had a proper answer to your whole of government accounts question, which you asked last year. Um, and you asked, could we have whole of government accounts? 
And the answer came back, which was completely messed up. We do not have whole, whole of government accounts. We could have them, but somehow or other people are stalling. Is this because the liabilities of Scotland would be shown if we had them? And this all adds up to, have we got the proper system in place to make sure that we are no longer a colony, but actually moving forward as this parliament expects to be doing? And it's, that's not just a criticism of politics, it's actually a criticism of the academic world as well. In the 1970s, when I produced the first paper I know of on um, public expenditure in Scotland, I was told at that time by the Scottish, head of the Scottish Journal of um, Economic Research that, in fact, that was a parochial thing that was not carried in Scottish journals. I see no difference today other than the Fraser of Allender. And, in fact, it was the Fraser of Allender that used that paper as one of the first economic reports. We have to change not only the effect of committees like this, but our academic world. It's appalling what um, John was able to tell us today about lack of interest. Why are we paying for any contribution to them if they're not actually producing decent stuff on the Scottish economy, which is helping groups like you? Um, did, did you want to expand on the point about why, since devolution, you say that hasn't been possible? I mean, I, I don't think uh, anyone we here seem would... still, Thank you. We seem still to have a mindset um, that we uh, are collecting data that uh, is feeding into a larger group. I'll give you examples on that, on uh, um, agriculture. Uh, you know, we're now not going to have any comment whatsoever on the agricultural statistics for five years. Here we are facing Brexit. Said in the papers, we probably wouldn't survive, the super, supermarkets probably wouldn't survive for four days <laughs> if things stopped. And as far as our agricultural statistics go, it's just a series of data. And it's meaningless to most of us on the way through. As far as, um, what else have I got? Uh, Fishing. If you go into fisheries and you ask about can quotas be changed from one group to another, you'll get a series of um, chats telling you, oh no, you can't move the quotas. But actually, you can sell the ships and the ships have the quotas. So you're lambasted with information, which at the end of the day is very difficult to understand. Now, I, I give you all a lovely thing to do over next week. Try it yourselves and see how many hours you spend on it and how much brandy you need at the end of the day. Uh, so we have a, we do have a big problem. But actually, I think a lot of you, in fact, knowing some of you on the way through, I think you'd actually be quite interested in what taxes could Scotland actually put in place that are not these ones that, as John defined, um, take up most of our taxation, but in fact don't necessarily help the poorest group in society. What about a land tax? I mean, that, that's just one of them, or many, one of the many, but I'm sure you could all think of other ones. Mm. Why are we still sticking to a taxation system that is maybe not appropriate to the Scottish economy or Scottish society? Right. Well, thank you. I think that's starting to strain the questions of um, politics and what we might do, whereas I think we're trying to focus yes. on what the statistics and data that we have at the minute this are. Richard Marsh, you wanted to come in. Do, and may I ask, do you think that the statistical team in Scotland has been less independent since devolution? Um, well, I suppose it's, I think I echo what Margaret says. It hasn't been independent since devolution. It, it, in terms of what's happened, it's really um, the pressure that's been placed on Scotland is really the independence, the effective independence of the Office for National Statistics. Um, what, what I'd say is we've got a Scottish um, Fiscal Commission and we have the National Accounts Team. They've both got around 11 people working for them. The National Accounts Team is by far the most important um, team in Scotland. Without producing that core economic data, we could not forecast. We would have nothing to work from. One of those teams is independent and well-resourced. The other is not. 
And we have to think carefully, have we got the priorities right? In terms of, I think, Andy Whiteman, you, you, you mentioned um, the Foreign Secretary uh, and the Statistics Authority. The, the, the example I, 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 kind of, I kind of give was, um, was um, JERS was produced last year on, uh, on the 24th of August. And it's a national statistics publication. It's a kite mark publication produced by the government. So we knew the data was coming out months in advance. The day before, a previously unannounced paper on the cost of Brexit to Scotland is produced without any warning on the Tuesday. And I think it was the BBC's Brian Taylor covered it to say, is this politics or arithmetic? And saying clearly the government is seeking to preempt the results of JERS the next day. That in itself is very worrying that you have a producer of official and national statistics that the BBC's Brian Taylor is suggesting could be seeking to preempt its own products. Whilst that's worrying, that there are two things that are hugely important that didn't happen. Unlike the situation over the weekend, the statistics regulator didn't say anything. It wasn't called up as a potential breach of the code of conduct. And perhaps more importantly, Scotland's chief statistician didn't say anything. So if you have an independent statistics body covering the UK saying they're disappointed and surprised at someone confusing a gross and net figure, the chief statistician, would, would, you'd suspect, would be furious, or as close to furious as a statistician can get, that someone's tried to preempt that someone within his own organisation has sought to preempt a kite mark publication. But at that moment, at the moment, the guy who's actually filling, effectively filling the role of the chief statistician and the regulator at the same time is effectively the BBC's Brian Taylor. And he's got a lot on his plate, so we shouldn't really be leaving this to, to the media to kind of police and point out the role of the statistics. When you say chief statistician, you mean the Scottish chief statistician? It, 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 it's a small distinction, but very important. For the ONS, the national statistician is independent of government. In Scotland, the chief statistician is the Scottish government's chief statistician. And do you think the chief ta statistician should have a different position or uh, terms of appointment if than at present? If we, think of, um, if we think of the situation I've just described, there are several instances along those lines. It's difficult to see how you can, you can foster that culture to say, I want you to be innovative, to think of new products, to actually be quite open and explaining what your statistics mean if you're not independent of the government of the day. So you think the chief statistician in Scotland should be independent of the government of the day? More independent. I suppose More independent. I, I find it hard to square, um, I suppose you'll all know better than I, than I will, the speed at which the Scottish Fiscal Commission was set up and constituted as a non-ministerial department. And we've had 20 years of a national accounts team who uh, sit within the rest of the civil service. Okay, I think uh, John Mason wanted to come in on this question of uh, the fury, fury of statisticians. I mean, I don't agree, I don't disagree, sorry, with uh, what Mr. Marsh is saying. I'm just wondering about the cost. I'm an accountant, so I suppose that's logical. Um, I mean, the Scottish Fiscal Commission was set up independently, despite the government and certainly myself disagreeing with that. And I think one of the factors was cost. I mean, we're 5 million people, the UK is 50 million, or England's 50 million. Um, we cannot possibly copy everything they do in the way they do it at that expense when there's a tenth of us. So has there not got to be some kind of compromise to, to do things smaller and I would hope more efficiently while like, at the same time having this independence? I, I, I love your statement there. Um, we can't possibly copy what they're doing, but we're trying our damnedest. Um, at the moment, statistics in Scotland, we try and ape a great deal of what's done for the UK. I think we should try and stop doing that. In terms of the cost for, say, an independent um, statistics body in Scotland, really the main thing that we need is for the head of a statistics profession in Scotland to be independent of government and be able to say, I think 
the most important things we should measure are the following five things. We'd be measuring the follow 40 things, and really they don't matter very much. We can have a debate around the table today. Everyone will have a view as to what they think should be measured for Scotland's economy, whether Jersey is fit for purpose or not fit for purpose. It doesn't really matter what Richard Murphy thinks or I think. It actually matters what an independent statistician thinks, and that's where you build trust in the statistics. Right. I want to bring Jamie Halko Johnson and then Richard Murphy, since he's just been spoken of, uh, to comment on this as well. Um, yeah, thank you, Camilla. It just kind of rather ties into that. Um, uh, Margaret Cuthbert mentioned the public sector and the lack of perhaps transparency in some of the contracts, the NDPBs. Um, obviously, you've talked about um, Chief uh, Statistician and their role. I was just wondering what the, um, the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government can do now to um, make, uh, to, to, I suppose, make some of that data more accessible, more transparent, what actions it could take, and also what perhaps national or uh, regional examples there are that we should be, or we could be looking to model ourselves on if, say, trying to um, kind of mimic the, uh, the UK, wider UK model isn't really suitable. Well, um, Margaret Cuthbert and then perhaps Richard. Murphy. Well, can I say, I say on the... Um, exports and imports um, and on quite a number of statistics I found actually that the Northern Ireland office has a, a cheaper system than we have and has a more timely system so that's possibly something we should look at. The other interesting thing was that when they are looking at for example um, public procurement they don't look at value for money, they look at value. A huge difference. So but there are things that we could learn from a much smaller country, um, which is still part of the United Kingdom, uh, on how they've managed it. I don't know. I haven't had the time to investigate. I only know the results. Richard Murphy. I do a lot of international comparisons in the work that I do around taxation. Um, and we often use median states for review because median is more important than mean, of course, in this area. And on that basis, Scotland is a median mid-sized state in its own right. Um, five million is plenty enough to put you well up the order, um, somewhere in the middle. So, you know, Scotland isn't a state, a region of the UK, however you view it, that is small in international terms. Um, yeah, the British Virgin Islands is, but Scotland most certainly isn't. Um, and on some things, the British Virgin Islands actually might produce better data than Scotland, which is quite shockingly true. Um, not many, but some. Um, so, and if you look at a place like Jersey, its national accounts are substantially better than those available for Scotland. I mean, much as it grieves me to say so, they've really got it right. And if they can afford that with 100,000 people, why can't Scotland with 5 million? So there is obviously an, an issue here, and actually it does come back to this issue of political will. I am very... Uh, first of all, let me make the point, all data is subjective. All data is political, because what you choose to measure is obviously a choice. Um, there is no such thing as objective data, because what you measure changes it. Um, we know that. It will change performance, it will change behaviour. So therefore I am worried about the concept of independence, just as much as I worry about the concept of independent central banks, which actually normally aren't at all, as we know in the case of the UK as a whole, because you only have to look at the Banking Act of 1998 to see that the Independent Bank of England is in fact subject to complete and direct control by the Chancellor, who can at any time suspend the Governor of the Bank of England if they don't do what he wants. Um, it's always been a he so far. Um, so therefore there isn't an Independent Bank of England independent national statistical authorities will have the same problem. There does, at the very least, have to be very sensible dialogue between the government as to what it needs to make decisions and what a statistical authority wants, which it thinks is important, because they may have different priorities. I wish to make that point very strongly, because otherwise you'll end up with information being produced for the wrong purposes again, which doesn't suit the political purpose of a government, but suits the political purpose of a director of a national statistical authority. And both will have, whether they like it or not, political purpose, because we all do. It just is a matter of fact. Whether it's party political doesn't matter. There will be political purpose to the decision. So in the end of the day, you might as well be explicit and have a very clear role for government in it, whilst that person must also have the right to squeal and say, I'm being put under too much pressure for a particular result. Um, Jackie Bailey. 
I wonder whether we could move on to a substantive discussion about jazz. Um, and let me quote back at you, Professor Murphy, some of the things that you are on record as saying, and perhaps get a view from the panel as to whether they agree with it or not. Um, and I hope I'm quoting you correctly, but um, you said that the jazz figures are untrustworthy, rigged by Westminster, literally made up and nonsense, and then you go on to say, no accountant could use the jazz methodology without risking the allegation of professional misconduct. I wonder whether I could put it to the panel, assuming I've quoted you correctly, whether any of them agree. Oh, I'll take silences. <laughs> <laughs> no agreement at all. Oh, Silence is not golden in this case. Um, Margaret Cuthbert. Yes. Well, in fact, as I wrote in my piece um, for this, I objected strongly to the word that Jairus was used as crap. Um, I don't know if... Um, Richard Marsh, uh, Richard Murphy, sorry, Richard. I don't know what's for you. Oh, no, I'll need to give you a big pudding when you come. Uh, anyway, I, I don't know if you have done as much work as Jim Cuthbert and myself in going through line by line uh, every bit of Jairs when we first got it under Freedom of Information. Since those days, I know that there's been tremendous work done on it by the statisticians. Almost every bit of data has... Uh, some bit of estimation in it. An estimate is worthwhile if it's got a small deviation on either side. And I would say that tremendous work has been done to try and reduce the um, uncertainty over some of these statistics. Now, there is a group which has been meeting on JERS. JERS keeps changing its... Um, composition to some extent as we go on. That group's meeting and is successfully considering changes to it. There are some things that I wouldn't necessarily agree with, but we cannot run an economy where the main taxes, etc., are from another, um, what do you call it, another uh, government, in a sense, and not have estimation. I can assure you over the years that the Department of Trade, HMRC and whatever have certainly all cooperated with me fantastically. I wonder if I could direct a very specific question then to Professor Murphy because um, your contention is that tax revenues generated, if I've understood you correctly, from spending outside Scotland should be attributed back to JAIRS. Now, um, if I've got that right, is it the case that this would be the only set of national accounts where that would happen in, or can you point to others where this is routinely done? Well, the question there is, of course, most national accounts are prepared for nations, and we're talking at the moment about Scotland not as, in that sense a nation. Um, we are talking about it as a part of the UK, because it is constitutionally a part of the UK at present, but it does obviously have its own parliament, which needs data. My point was very straightforward with regard to accounting. You can't have one basis for recognising income and another for recognising expenditure, one which is only income in Scotland and the other which is expenditure for Scotland, which includes expenditure therefore incurred outside Scotland, which does generate tax revenue, which is excluded from consideration on the income side, and then take one off the other, because that's simply apples and oranges accounting. They're not the same thing. If an accountant was to do that, I stand by the contention I made. I think they would be guilty of professional misconduct and I would expect them to be pulled up before for their professional body and told that you aren't preparing consistent accounts prepared in accordance with a consistent accounting basis, and that's what's required. So I, I completely stand by that. Um, the but suggestion but has been made that, that it will be that small. There are no other areas that produce national accounts in that way, in the way you've just described. I mean, I'm looking to try and be helpful. Is, is there you know, somewhere I can go see this, what you describe? Well, any country? There obviously is expenditure which can be incurred okay. outside a country. I mean, the point has been made to me, for example, that in the UK as a whole, we spend money on overseas aid. And that that spending takes place outside the UK and that tax may be paid on that in another country. And I would accept that point. And that has been said that, therefore, that is the same as the Scottish situation of having spending attributed to Scotland on which tax is not paid. No, it isn't, because 
That is paid by the UK government deciding to spend that money overseas, therefore under the central government direction and control. Whereas the point about, or the point I'm making about JERS, is that the expenditure which is allocated to Scotland is not under the control of the Scottish government. And therefore, if this is meant to indicate the activity within Scotland which is under the control of Scotland, it doesn't. So they are totally inconsistent. So I don't know of another example of that sort, okay. in other words. Okay. Um, that, that's helpful to know because I think it, you know, if you're making that suggestion of how to do things, then clearly we would want to look at other examples and there are none. I can't you know? think of one. OK, and, and neither could I, but in you know, fairness, you're, you're the professional rather than I, I'm me. I'm trying really hard um, to struggle to answer that, and I genuinely can't okay. think of one. Um, you, you then go on to say, and I, I just want to explore this because I think this is hugely important for us to stand, understand, um, you then go on to say that the net benefit flows very heavily from Scotland to the rest of the UK and the likely understatement of Scottish revenue resulting from this flawed approach to national income accounting is likely to be very significant. Have you got an order of magnitude for what is very significant? Well, How much money are we talking about? Again, one of the suggestions that came out from the discussion, the phrase that Allender was involved in this, was that this would give rise to a restatement. It, and if my basis of accounting was used, and I can't remember precisely the number your colleague uh, mentioned, but we're talking about a couple of percentage points or so of the stated Scottish deficit, maybe. But again, we, we're using some estimates here and very rough and ready stuff, which is done on the basis of blogging, not on the basis of you know, doing a lot of deep searching. And I'm not pretending I have. But the point here, and I'm not pretending I have done that deep searching, but the point here is that actually, even if you do the deep searching, I'm going to go back to Margaret's point here, actually. I mean, I know you didn't like the use of language, but I mean, I'm afraid to say I sometimes use language to put something onto a political agenda. It's, you know, I've been involved with trying to put deeply unsexy issues onto the political agenda for a long time. You know, tax wasn't discussed when I first started talking about it. Tax havens weren't discussed, and nor is national income accounting something which is normally picked up. But when you use some sorts of language which puts it in newspapers, well, I, as far as I'm concerned, if it creates discussion, it's worthwhile. But the point is, if we haven't got underlying data to prepare these estimates, I can't be sure. Can I just say you don't need to use that language to make this interesting to me? I'm already there. Um, can I, can I, <laughs> not can I, is. Can I, can I ask you, because Fraser of Allender did in fact look at the assumptions and, and uh, notions that you raised, um, and I quote from them, changing assumptions about how much spending is allocated for Scotland or spent in Scotland in JERS will change the net fiscal position, but any revisions are relatively small. So actually, rather than b being very significant, they are actually quite marginal. Would you not agree that that's the correct interpretation of the Fraser of Allender position? No, I wouldn't, and for a number of reasons. One is that, for example, we don't know flows in and out of Scotland, something that has been consistently said. We don't truly know what the income flows in and out of Scotland are, and I think if we don't know those, we might well be misstating what Scottish income is anyway. I mean, so we don't actually know some of the bases on which these estimates should take place. We don't also know what the multiplier effect is of some of this expenditure which is being incurred outside Scotland and might be. And I raise the point as well that we're not just looking about the impact of the expenditures at their first stage of measurement, but that actually in economic terms, you actually have a consequence of that spending which could be greater than the initial spend. There is a fiscal multiplier attached to these. That was not taken into account, as far as I know, in those figures. I am not disputing at the end of the day that the JERS methodology is going to show that there is a deficit for Scotland. Let me be clear about that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the methodology there is does not work at a theoretical level, and therefore we need to go back and start again. I'm basically suggesting, as Richard Marsh has done, that we should go back to a plain piece of paper and start from there. And if we did, we wouldn't end up with jurors, is my point. I, I think the, what I'm trying to do is understand your position and look for evidence of it. What I'm hearing from you is that there is no evidence that, that what you're doing is, is you know, asserting in, in the absence of numbers a particular position. I'm saying, and I, as far as I can hear, it has been agreed by Fraser Valentin, there would be a restatement of the figures if my position was correct. They've said but this would undoubtedly change the numbers. They've said it would be small. That is open to question. I'm saying it would be bigger than they say because they haven't taken a fiscal multiplier into account. But, but they're saying it would not be dramatic, and I'm saying it may be bigger than they're saying. Would it change overall? I don't know. So but I'm also saying JERS as a whole is incorrectly prepared and therefore is not the 
the basis for comparison for the well, future. Well, I'm trying to understand, is the basis, the evidential basis of you saying it's going to be very significant when we've had Fraser of Allender saying it's going to be very small? When the whole of this issue appears to be that Scotland is in a major fiscal deficit position and the data can't be certain to support that, particularly when we don't know what imports and exports from Scotland are, and therefore that figure may be heavily misstated. And actually, I am looking at data at the moment on Scottish imports and exports, which show that the data for Scotland looks to be so dramatically out of line with the norm that there's something obviously wrong with it. Then I think that we are in a position where we can say that data could be seriously misstated. Right. But do we know precisely? No, I accept that point. I'm okay. telling you, I've, I've said it time and again, we haven't got the data to be sure about that. Okay. But nor have you got the data to be sure you're right either, is my retort. I may be wrong, so may other people be. Rather, guess into the discussion. Um, before we do that, Richard Murphy, are you seriously saying that the, I think it's not a colony, nowadays it's a British overseas territory, the British Virgin Islands population, 28,000 plus, has better statistics than Scotland? Um, I think there will be some statistics they produce, not many, that will be better than Scotland. And I think in the case of Jersey, many of the statistics will be substantially better than Scotland. In particular, Jersey does produce quite reliable accounts which show who is responsible for what. Um, it does have GNI data, which is reasonably reliable. Um, and I think that actually it would be worth looking at. And if that island can produce better data, which is more decision useful probably than that which is available to many Scottish politicians, I think it's something that needs to be thought about seriously. Right, so it's something we'd have to look at the specifics of. Uh, John McLaren and then um, Cathy Montana. Just a brief point. <clears throat> if you're looking at Scottish exports and imports, then you know more than I do because there are no Scottish imports data. Uh, there's, a, there's an imputed residual in the, in the quarterly national accounts, but that's a, that's a huge problem because it's like, well, if anything is wrong uh, in, throughout the national accounts, it ends up in, in imports. So it's a highly questionable figure. And if you look at the figures, even for exports, there are two main measures for exports. Um, and quite often, year by year, one will go up and one will go down, which doesn't fill you full of hope um, that they're particularly accurate. Uh, but that's a slight move away from JERS. I mean, my main point I want to say on JERS is that um, <clears throat> I think the, the point that you have is, is, is of interest. I'm, I'm not sure it would change the... As you say, it wouldn't change the overall result. I mean, JERS is a bit of a dead end these days in that we know what it's going to say. I really wouldn't want to put an awful lot more time and effort and money into expanding it, perhaps a little bit, but the money could be better, far better spent elsewhere. Um, and and that's, where, that's where it should go. So I, I think if we can try and get away from simply... Much of this is, is to do with finance rather than the economy and I think it's you know if you concentrate on the economy and then go to the to go to the fiscal issues that are that are relevant to that but but a lot of the time we seem to be and perhaps because JERS dominates the, the 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 debate whereas when the quarterly national accounts are published it gets no coverage whatsoever this goes if I can just make the opportunity to go back to the point that Andy Whiteman talked about before um, if there's something in this data, whether it be JER or something else, that the statisticians aren't happy about, um, I mean, how often do you hear the, the head statistician in, in the UK speak out? Very rarely, or OBR, very rarely. It's actually exposed by the media and by think tanks, whether it's the IFS or, or the Financial Times. That's what we really lack in Scotland uh, in terms of, of getting through, holding um, the figures to account, holding public... Uh, public uh, the government to account, ministers to account, that there isn't the analysis being done by these independent bodies. You can ha you can create an independent statistician if you want, but it's not it's not really going to he or she, because they've got there as a career move partly. Um, uh, so it, it's it's these other elements that I think that need to be brought in. Um, but as I say, I think you know I think we've I think we've exhausted JERS in terms of the, the good it's going to do Scotland and the Scottish debate in terms certainly in terms of the economy. Uh, Katia Montana. I won't comment on chairs because I, I don't feel I've got enough expertise to do so, but I think it, it is certainly true that uh, one of the problems with the, the Scottish economic data is that it is not always possible to disentangle them from the UK ones. ones. But um, one point I would like to make is that uh, perhaps 
there has to be a more nuanced distinction between micro and macro data, because ultimately the macro data come from aggregating upward micro data. And uh, we don't have any data on imports, but even the data on export, which I think comes from the Global Connection Survey. Now, the Global Connection Survey has, has a non-return rate of about 70%. So it is based on a fairly small sample of firms. And it is also biased on known exporters. So it doesn't capture, for example, if there is a, a change in status of, of firms from non-exporter to exporter. So I think, you know, to go back, I, I think we need to, to have a, uh, I, I take all the points which have been, been made on, on the national accounts, but I think we need to have a more holistic approach and, and try to see the micro and macro side of the data as, as being more interconnected. And, and, and in this sense, to go back to the earlier debate about um, whether there should be a, a higher degree of independence of the uh, Scottish Statistical Agency. Certainly in the, long term, in the long term that would be important, but I also think, to go back to a point that uh, Margaret made earlier, I wouldn't be too concerned about the Scottish data collection system feeding into a higher level, because ultimately the major progresses which have been made in recent years in, 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 in Europe and beyond, they've been at an international level. So it is very important to join up forces, coordinate collection, follow, follow um, you know, uniform protocols to ensure comparability of data, because a lot can be learned in terms of being able to compare you know, the, the, the evidence which comes out of, of regional or national data internationally. Thank you. And Gil Patterson and John Mason wanted to enter the discussion on some of the points that have been made. On JERS, yeah. Uh, one, one of the biggest things sticking out for me uh, in JERS is the fact that so much money, billions of pounds, are spent, uh, money that's raised in Scotland in tax is spent for the Scotland. And so there's an impact in the first instance. The first whammy is that that money being spent somewhere else out with the Scottish economy. And then the second bit is that, that that money is spent primarily in another part of the UK. So that's the second whammy. The third whammy is this, and this is a big political... I, I don't think, uh, John, that we can ignore uh, JERS because it's used extensively uh, in one way or, or another, either to talk Scotland up or to talk Scotland down. And it's... and. Uh, you know, uh, Fraser Allender, for instance, published figures, uh, and everybody was they were already lining up the night before to say that Scotland was failing. So that's just an indication that Fraser Allender happened to be wrong. It went in the other direction. So it's a big, big polit political football. But the third whammy is this: is that the, the third whammy is this that the places that benefit from this. Scottish expenditure are used to measure against Scotland in a political sense. So these are these are big, big issues. Uh, and you know, looking at everybody that's written into us uh, in this exercise, there's nobody has said that the stats are good. Not one certain. Nobody has said what well, they're absolute brilliant. Everybody's got qualifiers all along, and Jers is the same. But so my my question is. You know, where, where is the information? Where is the information to say what the actual, the amount of money spent in the UK, not, not overseas, in the UK that's actually taken from Scotland? And what impact has that got in Scotland's economy? And what impact has that got in the place that we have been measured against? Where are the stats? You know, politicians should get that answer. It's so important. Perhaps John McLaren would like to comment on that since he's been mentioned, and then we'll come to John Mason. Difficult to know where to start. I mean, I disagree with virtually everything you said. Um, the, and, and I'm not saying that as a political. I mean, one the reason I think we should park chairs is because it is too political, and it does get to these um, uh, places where it's, it's good or it's bad. It's not. It's, it's saying something about what would happen if Scotland based on the current spending patterns and tax patterns, if Scotland became fiscally independent. That's all it's doing, which is not particularly interesting. But the di everybody who has looked at the figures agrees and has agreed for the last number of years that Scotland would be in a deficit position versus relative to the rest of the UK. 
as with Wales, as with Northern Ireland. There is nobody who has produced any figures to say anything else. Scotland got, uh, relative to the UK, I think it got, it's got worse than, worse than the last few years because of North Sea oil. It's not a great mystery as to what's happening. And it's not a great mystery as to why more money is spent in Scotland than in other parts of the UK, because Scotland is a third of the size of the UK and has a network of islands. So you'd expect more money to be spent per head. A little bit is, is earned in terms of tax per person, which is because there's not because London basically has a has a dis, um, an impact in, in terms of most of the high earners in London. But um, other than that, I don't think there's any mysteries around around the data in Jers. and then we'll bring in Margaret Cuthbert. Well, I was going to refer to her anyway, so she'll maybe come in anyway. Right. But um, yeah, I was going back to, at the, right at the beginning of the discussion in JERS, um, and Margaret Cuthbert was saying there had been improvements and kind of defended the position of there will always be estimates and we can make the estimates better. And that's the kind of technical area I'm interested in. Because I think I started off earlier this morning thinking that we should move everything to admin data and use that instead of like apportionment or estimates, and you can correct me if apportionment and estimates are the same thing or they're not quite the same thing. And then Professor Montana has been talking about microdata. I'm not quite sure if that's the same as administrative data. Um, but this concept of should we move wholeheartedly to just collecting every little company's details and adding them all up, and yet I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Marsh, you said that a lot of that, that is pretty messy or it, it's, it's not very dependable. Um, or do we just accept that apportionment for VAT or some of these things is, is perfectly acceptable? Are you asking me? Yeah. Well, right. why not? Well, it's, it's not perfectly acceptable. I'm, I'm actually very much in agreement with uh, John McLaren that there are other issues that are of much more importance for us right now in, in your job, in the Economics, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, than Jairs. Um, I really should be taking a bit more of a back seat. I have carried out endless conversations with various departments in England, in um, the UK government, on whether we can do any better than what we're doing just now. I can't see it without a tremendous amount of expenditure on our behalf of setting up units. And even at that, we don't have the political power to get information from companies. It, it doesn't exist. So I don't see how we can do anything else at the minute other than use UK departments to get the information. But HMRC seems to have moved from pretty vague estimates because they've been forced to with income tax, giving people an S code, and at least they will shortly have definite figures. Yes. So could, you, could we just do that with everything? Do the same with VAT, do the same with corporation tax, do the same with everything, or is it not as simple as that? I don't think it's any way as simple as that, actually, because of some of the things that Richard Murphy said um, and Richard Marsh. We've, we've got, it's a very dirty field, business data, and they are trying very hard in the ONS and in the Scottish Government to try and get more detailed um, local information. It's a huge job, and I don't know how long you would actually have to ask the statisticians themselves on that, how it's progressing. But at the minute, it's a job that's ongoing. Um, I don't know where it'll go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, Katia Montana. I'll briefly answer your question about the difference between microdata and administrative data. Yes. Microdata could be administrative data. Mi microdata is data collected, for example, at the level of the firm. And uh, in some cases, it is connected via questionnaire surveys. Other, in other cases, it's collected through VAT return. Mm -hmm. In that case, it is administrative data. So it, it typically tends to be more reliable than if it is correct, collected via surveys. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, there is recent re research which shows that uh, data collected by within the FAME database, which is a, a privately uh, produced mm -hmm. database, is less uh, uh, reliable in terms of information about whether firms are exporters or not than data uh, which come from HMRC. Uh, so, you know, ideally, the, the more the data is collected through VAT return and, and so on, the, the more reliable it is. Um, but it is, to mention another point that you, you made, it is, 
you know, very important to have as large a sample of the population of firms as possible. Because the reality is that the majority of firms across Europe, 98% of firms are, are small and medium enterprises, and, and about 60, 70% of those are very small. So if you leave them out, you actually miss out a lot of uh, economic activity uh, within a country. And, and the distribution of firms within industries is very important uh, in, in uh, enabling you know, us to understand the impact of policy, for example. So it's not, you know, if, if you, you, you can't focus on the average productivity of an industry, what matters is how the productivity distribution looks like. And there is a huge variation across industries, but also across regions and countries. There's a very recent pa experimental paper, they call it, by the ONS, which um, looks at productivity differences across regions, and they show that it is not the composition of industry which matters in determining the productivity of a region, it is the distribution of firms within industries. So there is a lot of information which is required in trying to, uh, to understand, for example, the productivity puzzle, which comes from firm level data. And that's why it is important to get it as much as possible. I think Ash Denham wanted to come in at this, this point. Um, if we're talking about decision useful data, because obviously as an economy committee we want to look at, at you know, the sort of data that might help us make more or better decisions. Um, we know that the Scottish Government at the moment is judging its progress on what they're calling the four I's, so I'll take it everybody's familiar with what they are. So are the existing stats that we have, you know, useful to judge whether the Scottish Government is making progress in those four areas or not? Margaret Cuthbert, yes. first of all. Yes. I have a big problem with that kind of data that the Scottish Government really needs. Um, Somebody's mentioned Scottish Enterprise already on the way through. If you look at any of these NDPBs and the information that is given, it's almost impossible to find out why they have said we have helped, let's say, 85% of businesses. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And then you say, well, is it advice? Is it finance? Is it whatever? And then how have you monitored the success of that? And how have you evaluated the programme at the end of the day? And uh, if you want to spend half a week in my filing cabinet, good luck to you. Um, it's impossible to get information. I've mentioned Scottish Enterprise. They cannot even split up for Scottish Development International how much they have actually spent on encouraging exports and how much they've spent on encouraging foreign direct investment. A committee has actually asked them for that information they were told they would get, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that just now. You'll get it. Well, we're still waiting. Um, because I ask, the, have you got it yet? And this is a year later, we still, they still don't have it. So there's a big, big problem in trying to get this type of information that the Scottish Government is happy to put forward, whether it's tr um, helping businesses, or the other one is um, on skills with modern apprenticeships. We're not getting back the real data that's needed. And again, when I ask you to go and look at the report by Skills on um, Modern Apprentices and sit there and think, instead of watching 10 o'clock news, what, they, what you're actually getting from that and the questions that you yourself obviously would ask and then phone them up and ask or write an email better. The answers are not there. We are living in cloud cuckoo land as far as the, this programme goes. Um, Richard Marsh and then um, Richard Murphy. Thank you very much. Um, I just to um, so address your question, it was the four eyes that the Scottish Government is, is, is working towards. Um, I think it wouldn't be entirely unfair to say we've decided to go down this road of a slightly different economic strategy with the four eyes. Um, with perhaps the biggest change being tackling inequality. Uh, and what's happened is we've looked at what data we have and said, how can we best use that to measure progress against these four eyes, rather than what more do we need to do to better fill in the gaps? I was at a, a business breakfast lunch in which someone from Scottish Enterprise was stood up and they're asked about this dimension of inequality and inclusive growth. And they said, well, we know what inclusive growth means. It just means growth. <laughs> and half the, half the room said, oh. 
and the other half, I thought was kind of, well, at least he's been honest. And I actually think that's probably where we are. I mean, in terms of what, what, what do we mean by inclusive growth and what kind of data should, should we be picking up, picking up on? Um, there, there's, a, there's a theme, I think John mentioned it, and Margaret mentioned it earlier to say, are we using the, da the data we've got, are we using it in the right way? If you look at the quarterly national accounts, the thing that jumps out on you is taxation on individuals has grown substantially over the last 20 years in Scotland. Taxation on businesses has been virtually unchanged. Virtually unchanged. Now, it, it, that isn't picked up at all. But that surely is a huge issue if we're going to raise the rate of VAT, raise income tax, at the same time cut corporation tax, and at the same time say we will tackle inclusive growth. I think those are the, that's the kind of data we actually have ready to hand that we should be investigating a bit more. And Richard Murphy. Thank you for your question, because it moves us on. Um, I will slightly hark back to Jers, though, in answering the question. Slightly. The, the, the four eyes make sense in a very real way. Um, you know, who wouldn't want investment, improved international trading positions, innovation, inclusive growth? I mean, it's sort of, you know, invert them all, and would you not want any of those? No. So, therefore, they must make sense. Um, they are a statement of what everybody would probably want. They may not put four eyes on the front of it. Does this help us? Uh, does the data we've got help us? Well, actually, no, in a very real way. Um, it doesn't answer the question why there isn't inclusive growth now, for example, because, and for example, we don't know how many assets there are in Scotland. We haven't got a figure. We haven't got a balance sheet. We don't know what is happening. We don't know whether there's a net investment or not because the accounts that are available are an income and expenditure account prepared, that's what JERS is, um, prepared on an inconsistent basis with no balance sheet to prove that there has actually been a net improvement or deterioration in the Scottish position, nor do we know who actually has the liabilities. It shows a deficit, but we actually it isn't clear who pays for that. And there's an apportionment which of liabilities which may be inappropriate. So to make this work, there needs to be a much better awareness that to drive any form of growth, to drive international investment. You've got to have measures of actually what is the capital accumulation that is taking place inside Scotland. And not the financial capital, but the actual real tangible physical capital, which is going to give rise to changes in productivity and the, therefore the increase in wages, which is obviously the driver, which is underpinning that, which is one of the reasons why at present Scottish ex state expenditure per head is higher than it is in the rest of the UK because average wages in Scotland are lower than in the rest of the UK, which is also true of Wales and Northern Ireland, which is why it appears that so much of the UK deficit is attributable to the regional governments rather than to England. So without that information, which is about assets, then you can't also, and a proper balance sheet, and who's funding that, you can't actually come up with an answer to these questions. And you can't come up with an answer to that question until you know who's actually also funding that process. And right now, that is not clear either, because there isn't a Scottish liabilities side of the balance sheet either. Um, and is Scotland liable for the debts that are recorded as a result of deficits being incurred? Because actually the Scottish Government can't be liable for those debts because it hasn't got the capacity to pay the debt. It's not allowed to pay the debt. So therefore, you know, I go back to Jers and say that's a completely meaningless statement for a world that doesn't exist. A Scotland that would be independent, that does everything that the UK does now, but clearly wouldn't, and which has a liability for something that it may not have incurred, because who knows whether it would pick it up. You know, it is just make-believe, the existing data. So that's why you have to go back to this question of saying, what do you want? If you were going to get meaningful information, you would want information on both asset growth and liabilities to fund that, as well as, therefore, this information. And that goes back to the apportionment issue. In the paper, I discussed how to apportion some aspects of tax, which is an issue on which I've done a lot of work. I created the idea of country-by-country country reporting, which is now being used as the basis for potentially apportioning corporation tax liabilities internationally as the basis of OECD recommendation. It's now law in 100 countries. Um, so, you know, it's, I've, I've been around this area for some time. 
And it is done on the basis of estimates. Let's be clear about it, because there isn't enough data to ever be certain you can apportion corporation tax accurately over international boundaries. So a basis of estimation has been used, and it's based upon where are the sales? The only difficulty being is that Scotland doesn't know how many sales it's got. Why? Because there isn't reliable VAT data on sales in Scotland. And it's sales to end consumers that matter here. But it isn't there. That would also require reliable import data, of course, as well. And export data to count those sales out of consideration. There isn't the data so with sufficient accuracy, maybe, although I think we're getting close to it, on the number of employees in Scotland. I think that one is probably being resolved. And the third indicator is assets, and that isn't there. So in very real sense, the data required to fulfil the current Scottish economic policy, which, as I say, makes sense because nobody would oppose those four things, um, in that sense, there isn't the data to actually fulfil that promise. So you know, let's start the whole thing from scratch again. What, what is required to actually make rational economic decisions in Scotland should be the question, which is why I extended my paper beyond the six pages I was allowed, right. for which I apologise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Andy White wanted to come in on these points before we move on to a question from Julian Martin. Thank you, Convener. I, I want to ask, actually ask a question about productivity data, so it may not be appropriate well, this time. Um, please do so. Okay, thank I'll you. Try and <laughs> then move on. Um, so one of the one of the key um, bits of economic um, data that is talked about quite a lot is, is productivity, and I just want to ask John McLaren. Um, I mean, in your paper, you say that this is tricky to collect and analyse, and that in order to make like-for-like -like comparisons with other countries, a number of adjustments need to be made. I just wonder if you can give us any sense on the record about how big a job that's likely to be, um, and whether we're, in other words, able to get better figures on productivity to make um, political debate and economic choices more, 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 more meaningful. I mean, it is a key measure because it's likely to <laughs> over the over the longer term, um, make the economy stronger and stronger. However, if you're trying to compare uh, the USA with France, with Germany, with uh, with the UK, first of all, you need to adjust for um, how long people are working for. Um, so it's not just uh, these adjustments include. Um, so it, it, is it per person, is it per job, is it per hour? All of these things will give you different results. Then it's what are they working at? Are they in manufacturing? Are they in services? Are they in public services? All these things have different um, uh, productivities attached to them. So the reason you are being less productive may be because you've got a shorter, or a, um, a longer, um, uh, you're working longer than in other areas. So for example, France has quite sh short working hours. The United States has quite long working hours, and France is actually quite productive, partly because it's got quite shorter hours, and there's quite a large unemployment. So that means the people who are most productive are in work, so it looks like they're actually quite productive. Um, so one of the reasons that the productivity um, thing happened in the UK in, in the last uh, downturn was North Sea Oil has come down a lot. Clearly, hardly anybody works in North Sea Oil, but they were making huge amounts of profits, and all that just virtually disappeared. And also financial services, which took a huge hit. Again, not that many people working it, but a lot of um, um, a lot of money sort of being attached to them. So that, that partly explains. So as I say, the, the, the industry composition, um, you'll learn how you can then put in skills levels and, 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 and issues like that. You need, you need to adjust for all those to try and get to a like for like. But, that, but then again, it's like, well, if you're adjusting for those things, should you adjust for them? Because actually the skills is important. So it's the skills that you need to address in terms of policy. But you've probably perhaps worked more in this area than I have. In Sorry, um, Kathy, can I have, uh, you talked about labour productivity, essentially, and, and that's one dimension. And even there, an additional problem that you didn't mention is prices. We don't have prices. So um, we are, you know, if, if the, an increase in productivity could simply be a reflection of an increase in inflation, and we don't know. What, what is behind it. The other, the other thing is that more, more uh, meaningful measures would be factoring in other factors of production, energy consumption, intermediates, um, um, and, and uh, so total factor productivity is a better measure, but 
it is not it is not being calculated. I mean, the ONS is starting now. They've they've written an experimental paper in uh, which came out in April 2017. Again, the major uh, progress in this area has been done at the European level. The European Union is funding the Map Compete project, which brings together academics and uh, and uh, statistical offices of many countries. The UK, unfortunately, is not part of that. Um, and so there are big methodological issues and there are big data requirements because when we talk about productivity, I mean, the, 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 the metaphor I like to give the students is like, you know, it's like peeling an onion. You know, you, you may even measure productivity correctly, but then what matters is what determines it. So uh, you, you can identify the proximate causes, but you, you need to be able to go to the ultimate causes to know what, in terms of economic policy, you can do about it. And that requires information which comes from within the black, the black box of the firm. You need information, for example, about management practices. Again, the ONS has, has, has reacted to the, the world uh, management survey which was produced by, uh, which has been initiated by Bloom and, and Van Rienen, uh, who was, used to be at the LSE, is now in Harvard. And, uh, I don't necessarily fully agree with the spirit of, it, of the exercise entirely because I think that environmental factors are important, but what they do is to identify and quantify um, elements of management practices which can then be used uh, into total factor productivity estimates because they think manage, they, they, they look at management basically as a technology. Okay? Now, it may well be that ultimately, at the end of peeling the onion, what you're, at the core, what you're left with are environmental factors such as agglomeration economies. But it is important to understand how, uh, and I go back to your point about behavioral responses, you know, how firms and investors react. I mean, um, one of the, the messages which, which comes out of this uh, firm level view of the world is essentially that some of the macro factors that people think about like unit labor cost are, re are, are less relevant than we like to think. Unit labor cost is not a very good predictor of a country's ability to export. And, uh, and in fact, uh, it may well be the case, as some have suggested, that uh, low unit labor cost, which result from a very high deregulation of labor markets, for example, may well be responsible for low productivity because it incentivizes firms to substitute labor for capital, or rather capital for labor, yeah? It's no, labor for capital. So um, it is important, and I, I go back to the point I made earlier, it is important to, you know, to um, overcome this dichotomy between macro and micro data, because they are really very much uh, connected. And, and, and te in terms of understanding the ultimate causes of productivity, we need to be able to go into the black box of the firm. Up that a bit, saying the, uh, once you've un, unwrapped the onion, then you're left with sort of total to, uh, fact, um, multi factor productivity or total factor productivity, which is actually nothing tangible. It's, it's innovation, it's these things that happen that, that make yeah. economies very good, but they, you can't actually, and that's the tantalizing thing of like, well, what countries are doing that well? And it's like management practices, it, it's R&D uh, being used well, it's working with universities. But it just takes you to this sort of, as I say, intangible element that you've then got to, to, um, to understand. But you know, this isn't easy. If it was easy, every country would be doing it and growing quickly, yeah. and they're not. Yeah, but that is why international cooperation and, and also a cooperation with academics is essential. But there's a, sorry, I want to move on to a question now from Julian Martin. My question is actually related to what yeah. we're talking about, because one of the, the gaps that has been identified, and quite a few of you, is around um, what goes on in the household, what goes on in the families, um, and I suppose that comes down to that, that, that data you're talking about. So we have a situation where government are making decisions around policies which, on the surface of it, might look expensive, but could generate economic activity. Enhanced free childcare, for example, would be, would be one example. A progressive policy or something that encourages the living wage. How can we measure What's, what's missing in the data sets that are available to us to be able to look at how those policies have worked and how they've been able to stimulate the economy? Because then you can make the, the case for more progressive policies, because that's one of the difficulties for the government is to say, well, actually, 
by giving families enhanced childcare, this is not a massive expense. This is actually going to generate a lot more uh, economic activity. Professor Montana? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say I would go back to a point I made earlier: the linkability of data sets, because there are there is quite a lot of information about, for example, the you know the BHPS has got a lot of information, the British Household Panel data has got a lot of information about some of these issues, and and I'm sure there are other data sets which don't come to mind at the moment. But the important thing is to be able to link them up, because there may well be very clear causal links between some of the aspects you mentioned and the productivity of the firms. For example, we were trying to, uh, we have been thinking uh, to, to uh, set up a, a project looking at the impact of manager, management practices on productivity, but um, through the channel of worker satisfaction. Okay? Because management practices have got a lot to do with how the, the workforce is managed within the firm. And we couldn't do it because we didn't have management data. And, and in fact, we got in touch with uh, Van Rien and to see whether they were prepared to replicate their study in Scotland. And their, a priori um, impression was that we wouldn't be able to have a significantly large number of firms to make the sample significant. Um, now, luckily, the ONS now has started with, with this uh, management practices pro project. and, and uh, um, maybe in the near future it should be possible to do something like that. But I mean, what, what you say is very pertinent. Clearly, there are links between different things. And that's why I say it's important to have a kind of holistic view of these things, because if you start peeling the onion, the, the nice links which come out are endless. Mm -hmm. And it's important to be able to establish causality between the different aspects. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've got he written in our papers longitudinal data. There's very limited data on a longitudinal basis of Scottish households, particularly in terms of issues like income, wealth and spending. And I'm interested to he get feedback from the panel on, on that. I think John McLaren wants to come in and perhaps um, Richard Murphy briefly and uh, also Margaret Cuthbert. So perhaps John McLaren first. I wanted to come in on your previous point, if you don't mind. Um, I think things like early years intervention, um, which has a lot of evidence behind it, um, that it will be good for, for um, uh, in terms of uh, prosperity and sharing prosperity. The, the trouble is, and I've, I've been looking at this for quite a long time, the, the trouble is find to, trying to fi find the money to put into it, because all the money at the minute is being put into primary education or secondary education or tertiary education. Um, because that's politically, and to be honest, with a lot of the public, that's, that's where the money already goes, and you've got to fight damn hard to take it off them to put it somewhere else, even though there's a huge amount of evidence. I mean, there is an issue about implementation versus picking the right policy, as perhaps we've seen recently in Scotland in terms of education. But, but these things can be identified. I think one way of potentially um, bringing it into a higher profile and, and, and bringing it up with GDP is something that is sort of like concentrated on, is to have, as well as GDP, have another, a wider measure, which looks at, it might sound more like social things, but things like ed health, education, environment, wealth, wealth distribution, and things like that, and have that as a measure, perhaps an annual measure. Um, a, it would be innovative so that other countries could look at it, but it also sort of it says it's not just about GDP, it's about all these other things, education, early years, which will eventually, should eventually improve GDP. So if you can show that these other things are improving, that hopefully will eventually improve GDP, you widen out the issue to just being about has GDP written, written, risen by 1% or 2% or 3%, which is not really that interesting uh, 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 and, and it doesn't get you very far. But it's so it's like trying to get that that wider measure, still keeping a, a focus on economics to some extent, but but highlighting the elements that goes in to GDP rising rather than just the final element itself. And I think there's a there's you know not many countries really do it, so I think there's a there's um, quite a good opportunity for Scotland to be in the forefront in an area like that. <clears throat> um, Richard Murphy, briefly, please. A brief comment, and I made it the mention before, and it's in my paper, I've talked about a capital maintenance concept. That means a balance sheet and an idea that you're investing. Productivity is about the relative input of labour and capital. Some investment in early years may be a capital spend. It is designed to create longer-term impacts than the current year, in other words. But 
the current system of accounting just looks at income and spend and without any consideration as to whether there may be a benefit over time. But that, because of that absence, you can't make that sort of decision because you can't say the benefit will be three years hence inside the accounting system. There should be a system where it is possible to recognise that spending now is for future benefit. And obviously that will be subjective. There will be differences of opinion on what does give rise to future benefit or not. But unless you've got that, you have the problem. And that then also means that you can actually look at current capital invested. And I would just put it to you that at the moment, Scotland hasn't got the degree of debt it should have because it hasn't had the capital expenditure it's got. We know that's true. So you know, some of the apportionments are wrong because if we actually understood what is capital in Scotland, we'd realise there's far too little of it and therefore we're being Scotland is being charged for capital it hasn't even got, um, for example. But unless you have that extra dimension to decision making, you can't make informed decisions. And Margaret. Yes. Well, just briefly on that point that um, Richard's made, um, for long enough, the pair of us, there's another guy sitting beside me, Jim Cuthbert, um, the, for long enough, we have believed that JERS is too static and we do need um, to place it in time and also it has to connect with other major statistics that are produced in Scotland and that's not happened. But if I can on to your point about family household money, um, I'd also like that to include geography. Um, we can see quite clearly in Scotland that some of the cities do quite well, but the areas that are close to it, like North Ayrshire, are really doing very badly indeed. Now, there are statistics that we could be using, pulling them together, which would give us a much, much better picture of what's happening in Scotland, rather than just looking at disability benefit or whatever, it's all, all the different things that are called... Um, support that's given, how children are doing at schools, how many are getting into higher education. We now need to do what you call a multivariate analysis in this to try and find out how best to spend our money and how that money has been used in the past and whether it's been successful. We actually have the data. We could be spending some big effort. Academics could be spending some big effort on doing a study on that and it would be, I think, extremely useful and help you with the issues. And I, I agree very much with, um, I think it was John brought in, you need to look at other aspects as well as children, it's the, the whole caboodle. And these social matters really matter for the economy. Richard Marsh. Very quickly. Um, just to address Gillian's um, question, it, it's less a question about what economic data is available to evaluate those policies. And actually, when you start looking at the policy, having a very clear idea how you're going to measure it and looking at what's available, and actually you might collect some new data whilst the policy is being rolled out. We actually, one of the biggest flaws we have in Scotland is not setting out how we're going to measure things once we actually start rolling out a policy. There, there was... Um, I'm going to mention Andy Whiteman here, I think, briefly. But there was a good paper, I think, produced by Andy on um, the, uh, the fringe and whether or not people who are renting out their flats should be paying tax. Now, that, I assume it might not have been, maybe it was some sort of highly talented researcher behind the scenes pushing the buttons, but it was an elegant, clever, really good piece of research um, I don't necessarily agree with the conclusions, but actually the process, you could almost say, well, why aren't we doing that for very large government programmes? So it's, it's less a question, I suppose, about what statistics are available and having the political will to say we have a genuine interest in saying, does this work or not? Thank you. Um, Dean Lockhart wanted to do a follow-up there, and then perhaps we'll come to John Mason for a last question. No? All right. Well, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. It was, um, just to wrap up on this need for more holistic me measurements, uh, John McLaren mentioned the, the index of social and economic well-being in his paper, and I think there seems to be some consensus that we don't just look at G GDP, we need to look at a, a broader um, scope of uh, measurements, and, and the data seems to be there. How can we take that one step further? How can we further embed and bring into the mainstream 
measures like the Index for Social and Economic Wellbeing, so that we look at, look at policies in the round um, in terms of the impact on education as well as the economy? Well, I mean, I think regular... Publish, publishing it re regularly and being behind it so that you, as a government, say we take this seriously so that when it is published, you have a press conference or whatever to say, and we're going to do this, that or the other. One of the things that came out of the, the one that I published the other week was that Scottish, uh, the, the Scottish life expectancy remains, outside of Eastern Europe, the worst in any OECD, well, the worst in any developed OECD country, as it has done for a number of years. In many ways, that is the big thing that is the worst aspect of Scottish lifestyle, well, the, the Scottish social economic sort of uh, in, environment, and it hasn't improved over the last 10, 20 years probably. Why is it not improved? Because we're concentrating on the NHS, and because that figure isn't really highlighted that much. Why is it important to the economy? Well, if, we're, if our life expectancy is poor, and our healthy life expectancy is even poorer, then it's, uh, that probably relates to poverty as well. Then these are the, some of the issues which are explaining partly why Scot why, what could be done better to improve Scotland's growth rate by improving health, not through the NHS, but through preventative measures and areas like that. So although it doesn't seem like the economy, it is the economy, but you have to give it a high profile and share it. <clears throat> so it's kind of like... It's not the outcome, which is GDP. It's what's the, the core things that are feeding into the outcome. Um, now, clearly, you can't have, it's difficult in areas like the environment, which you might want to include as well, but it's not impossible. Um, and these things do move quite, move quite slowly, whereas the economy moves up and down quite quickly. Life expectancy can move quite slowly, although in the last 10 years or so, the Estonians have gained f over four years of life expectancy, which is pretty good. The do you mind if I add to that? We've got to, this, I think what John said is absolutely right. We've got to, however, look at the whole of Scotland as well. And there are areas in Scotland that really have just been left um, and their heart pulled out of them. So we've got to have a, when we're devising a policy, we've actually got to look at other aspects like transport on the way through, which seems to, relative to what has happened in the south of Ireland, the island itself, we've missed the boat. We've, so our policies have to be inclusive of the other aspects, not just health, but um, transport and good communications throughout Scotland so that we're one society rather than bits that have been left to die. And uh, a brief comment from uh, Richard Murphy, and I think Katia Montana wanted to come in as well. This goes right back to the core of redesigning the data. If you're a company, you think you're maximising profit. You may not be, but that's what you think you're doing, or you want growth, or whatever. You cut, choose your indicators, your key performance indicators, which are going to be the drivers of your business, and you create a measurement system to provide data to say, are you succeeding or not? Actually, before even redesigning the information system for Scotland, you've got to decide what are the key performance indicators which are actually going to be driving this. And that is a political choice. That's why I said all data is political, because what you choose to measure, how you choose to measure it, is a political choice from the beginning to the end. And if you don't choose the right KPIs, then you're going to come up with data which doesn't suit the purpose. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions from committee members... Um then that is our time today. So thank you very much to all of our guests for coming in. Thank you very much. We'll now move into private sessions, so I'll allow five minutes for the gallery to clear. Thank you.